Hi everyone, I'm Linda Reimer, one of the librarians at the Southeast Stabend County Library in my makeshift Mardi Gras Halloween outfit. Welcome to Library Connections, our weekly readers, viewers, and listeners advisory video cast. And happy Halloween! Library Connections number 27, hosted by SSCL librarian Linda Reimer. This video cast is being recorded on Thursday, October 29th, 2020. Kicking things off with the top five fiction bestsellers for this week from the New York Times. At number one, A Time for Mercy by John Grisham. The third book in the Jake Brigand series. A 16 year old is accused of killing a deputy in Clanton, Mississippi in 1990. At number two, The Return by Nicholas Sparks. A doctor serving in the Navy in Afghanistan goes back to North Carolina where two women change his life. At number three, the Searcher by Tanya French. After a divorce, a former Chicago police officer resettles in an Irish village where a boy goes missing. At number four, The Evening and the Morning by Ken Follett. In a prequel to The Pillars of the Earth, a boat builder, a Norman noblewoman, and a monk live in England under attack by the Welsh and the Vikings. And at number five, Anxious People by Frederick Backman. A failed bank robber holds a group of strangers hostage at an apartment open house. Certainly sounds like an anxious story. Moving on to our top five nonfiction bestsellers for this week. At number one, Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. The Academy Award-winning actor shares snippets from the diaries he kept over the last 35 years. At number two, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. The activist and public speaker describes her journey of listening to her inner voice. At number three, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. The Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist examines aspects of caste systems across civilizations and reveals a rigid hierarchy in America today. At number four, Killing Crazy Horse by Bill O'Reilly and Martin Duggard. The ninth book in the conservative commentator's Killing series focuses on conflicts with Native Americans. And at number five, One Boat Away by Ted Cruz. The Republican senator from Texas gives his views on what might happen if liberals gain a simple majority on the Supreme Court. And before I jump into info on our first recommended read of the week, just a quick note about formats. I am working on improving our Library Connections video cast so that you can tell at a glance in which catalog each item is available. So for this week, you'll notice at the top, it says the Cold Millions is available as a print book. It's also available in the digital catalog and through the Overdrive and Libby apps as both an ebook and audiobook. And so I will be tweaking the video cast in future episodes to include that information. But for this week, we've got the recommended reads, Overdrive reads, and then going into streaming videos recommendations for the week. So having said that, basically we're, we're in transition here with Library Connections. I'm going to make it better. But for right now, on to the first recommended read of the week. The book is The Cold Millions, written by Jess Walter. In Spokane, in 1909, love, more than idealism, moves 16-year-old Bry Dolan to follow his older brother Gig, against Gig's wishes, to a free speech protest and as a result, to jail. When it's discovered that he's being kept in the brutal, overfilled prison as a minor, he's released and becomes a rather unwitting spokesperson for the industrial workers of the world, or the IWW. 
the labor union behind the rally for which Gig is a vocal organizer. With Gig still in jail, Rye is taken under the wings of both a local mining millionaire and Gurley, which is how real-life IWW activist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is mostly referred to in these pages. The precarious from the start setup introduces Rye to more suffering and more possibilities than he known existed in his difficult young life. It forces him to forge a path outside of his beloved older brother's shadow. Strung up around true events and a handful of real people, Walter's latest is informed by intensive, ardent research and reverence for his home city. Consider this book a train ticket to a pastime and place. In addition to boldly voiced characters and dramatic suspense, in this century ago tale of labor rights and wealth inequality, readers will find plenty of modern relevance. And that is the Star Bookless Review, and that one is certainly on my to-read list. So many books, so little time, but definitely I want to read that one. Moving on to our second recommended read for the week, Magic Lessons by Alice Hoffman, available in print format through StarCat and as an ebook in the digital catalog. Hoffman's striking latest entry in her Practical Magic series turns to 1664 rural England for the origin story of Maria Owens, matriarch of the series' clan of witches. Maria is discovered as an infant by Hannah Owens, a practitioner of the nameless art, who raises Maria and teaches her natural remedies and witchcraft. As a girl, Maria has an innate sense of magic and emulates Hannah's desire to help the scores of women who secretly come to her for help, mostly for problems with their love lives. After Maria is reclaimed at age 10 by her birth mother, Rebecca, another nameless art practitioner, Maria comes to understand, like other heroines in Hoffman's magic books, that love can be unexpectedly overpowering. Maria becomes ensnared in a complicated relationship and has a daughter out of wedlock. As Maria's story takes her from England to Massachusetts, and later in New York, Hoffman offers an eye-opening account of how single women were treated in the 17th century, particularly when their knowledge or intelligence was deemed threatening. While the musings on enchantments and remedies grow repetitive, Maria's page-turning adventure is thoroughly enjoyable. Hoffman's redemptive story of a fiercely independent woman adds an engrossing, worthwhile chapter to the series. And that is the publisher's weekly review. And that's another one that's on my to-read list. Moving on to our first overdrive recommendation of the week. It's the new Sophie Kinsella novel, Love Your Life. A spellbinding romance comes to a crashing halt in the sparkling latest from Kinsella. Ava, an aspiring author and hopeless romantic, arrives in Italy for a week-long writer's retreat, where to facilitate productivity and limit small talk, everyone is required to remain anonymous. From the moment she meets Dutch, a gorgeous stranger staying at the same monastery, she feels her life fallen stunningly into place. They embark on a whirlwind romance, and on their last day in Italy, vow to make their relationship work back home in the UK, no matter what reality brings. But as soon as they return to London, their magical bubble is burst. Dutch is not the carefree carpenter Ava imagined him to be, but Matt Warwick, COO of a successful dollhouse company. While chaotic Ava enjoys rescuing abandoned furniture and books, measured Matt can't abide clutter. For her part, Ava can't stand Matt's horrific art collection, 
and shivers all night in his freezing bedroom. Worst of all, Matt is not a fan of Ava's beloved but badly behaved beagle, Harold. In the face of these unexpected differences, can they really find a way to keep their promise? Kinsella's clever romance about the nature of compromise alternates laugh-out-loud humor with moments that will tug at readers' heartstrings. This rollicking rom-com is a hit and an upbeat read to boot. Moving along to our second Overdrive recommendation of the week. Yes, I know it's another holiday title, but as I keep mentioning, if you don't request some of these titles now, you won't get to enjoy them before the holidays. It'll be, you know, Valentine's Day. So this one is called Christmas at the Island Hotel. It's written by Jenny Colgan and read by Elizabeth Beaton, and the format is an audiobook. Another heartfelt and delightful Christmas tale from the beloved New York Times bestselling author of The Bookshop on the Corner and Christmas on the Island. On the tiny, beautiful, and remote island of Muir, halfway between Scotland and Norway, a new hotel opening is a big event. New mother Flora McKenzie and her brother Fenton are working themselves half to death to get it ready in time for Christmas. The new hotel's impressive kitchens throw together two unlikely new friends. Isla Gregor is the hardworking young girl who has been a waitress in the island's cafe, dreaming of a bigger, better life now that she's at a proper fancy hotel. Constantine Pedersen is working his way up in the hotel's kitchens too, but he is also, secretly, the only son of the Duke of Utsire. Constantine has been sent to learn what it is to work hard for a living before receiving his inheritance. Although he's initially resentful, the place grows on him. He has never met anyone quite like Isla and her fellow Murians before. As the island's residents and special VIP guests gather for the hotel's grand opening gala, Christmas is in the air. But so are more than a few small town secrets. And that sounds like a great story, a hopeful story to listen to at this time of year. Moving on to our streaming video recommendations for this week. Our first one is a classic. It's the 1985 film Clue, available through Amazon Prime Video. In this spoof of McCarthy era paranoia and 1950s wholesomeness, the characters and plot are drawn from the popular Parker Brothers board game of the same name. On a dark and stormy night in 1954, six individuals with ties to Washington are assembled for a dinner party at the swanky mansion of one Mr. Body. Body's butler, Wadsworth, assigns each guest a colorful name. Mr. Green, Colonel Mustard, Mrs. Peacock, Professor Plum, Miss Scarlet, and Mrs. White. Two additional servants, the cook and Yvette the maid, assist Wadsworth as he informs the guest that they have been gathered to meet the man who has been blackmailing them, Mr. Body himself. When Body turns up dead, however, the guests must try to figure out who killed him so they can protect their own reputations and keep the body count from growing. Three separate endings were filmed for Clue and shown in different theaters. All three are collected for the video edition. And just a trivia note, although the film is set in the 1950s, the original Clue game was actually devised by Anthony Pratt, a clerk in Leeds, England, to pass the time during World War II air raid drills. And all of that information and summary is from RogerEbert.com. And moving along to our second streaming recommendation for this week, it's the film Moneyball from 2011, available through Netflix. The film centers on the character of the Oakland Athletics general manager, Billy Bean, who after a bad start as an MLB player, moved over to management and was driven by his hatred of losing. 
in his previous season. He'd taken the A's to the World Series, only to have them lose and then see their best three players hired away by richer teams offering much bigger salaries. Faced with rebuilding the team at bargain basement prices, Bean became persuaded by the theories of Peter Brand, a nerdy recent Yale graduate who crunched numbers to arrive at a strict cost-benefit analysis of baseball players. Persuaded Bean that he should hire based on key performance statistics that pointed to undervalued players. Together they assembled a team that seemed foolhardy at first, but during the course of an agonizing season, proved itself the biggest bargain in baseball. Moneyball earned six Academy Award nominations, including Best Pitcher. Our third and final streaming recommendation for this week is the new film On the Rocks, available through Apple TV+. The writer-director Sofia Coppola reteams with Bill Murray, the star of her film Lost in Translation, for On the Rocks, a light comedy that functions as both a New York City travelogue and a story about father-daughter bonding. Murray plays Felix, dad to Laura, a married mom who thinks her husband may be having an affair. Laura enlists Felix to help her play private eye, but as they hop around the city looking for clues, they end up talking as much about their own relationship as about her marriage. As Coppola showed with Lost in Translation, as well as with Somewhere and Marie Antoinette, she has a knack for making worlds of wealth and privilege look both beautiful and stark, filled with lost and lonely people clinging tightly to what and who they love. And finally, our Hoopla recommendation for this week. This one's a streaming video. It's a Halloween classic. It's the Vincent Price film House on Haunted Hill. A millionaire offers $10,000 to five people if they last all night, trapped in the haunted house he rented for the party he's throwing for his fourth wife. When you consider that the millionaire is played by Vincent Price and that the film is directed by schlock master William Castle, you can bet that everyone's in for a long and bumpy night. This super shocker of the century was a smash hit upon its 1959 release. And for architecture buffs, the home used for the exteriors of the haunted house was actually designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and built in 1924. And moving on to our odd duck recommendation for this week. This week I'm going to talk about phone scams, and indeed we do need to be aware of them because they are increasing during our pandemic era. The FTC has an informative article on this subject that you can find by Googling FTC phone scams or by typing in the whole long website address seen in the middle of your screen. I'm going to assume most people don't want to type in the website address, so I've shown you at the bottom of the screen the search that I would enter, FTC phone scams. And then on the right side of the page, phone scams, FTC consumer information, and you'll notice that above the title of the article, it has that same website address, so that is the correct website page. So if you click on that link, and we're going to pretend that you have, this page will pop up. And this is the FTC phone scams page on their website. The issue of phone scams is an important one because scammers are getting ever more creative in finding ways to trick people into either giving them personal information or charging them a fee for something that sounds like it is legitimate but isn't. The FTC has some great tips regarding how to recognize a phone scam including the following. There is no prize. The caller might say that you were selected for an offer or that you've won a lottery. But if you have to pay to get the prize, it's not a prize, it's a scam. You won't be arrested. 
scammers might pretend to be law enforcement or a federal agency. They might say you'll be arrested, fined, or deported if you don't pay taxes or some other debt right away. The goal is to scare you into paying, but real law enforcement and federal agencies won't call and threaten you. You don't need to decide now. Most legitimate businesses will give you time to think their offer over and get written information about it before asking you to commit. Take your time. Don't get pressured into making a decision on the spot. There's never a good reason to send cash or pay with a gift card. Scammers will often ask you to pay in a way that makes it hard for you to get your money back by wiring money, putting money on a gift card, prepaid card, or cash reload card, or using a money transfer app. Anyone who asks you to pay that way is a scammer. Government agencies aren't calling you to confirm your sensitive information. It's never a good idea to give out sensitive information like your social security number to someone who calls you unexpectedly, even if they say they're with the Social Security Administration or the IRS. You shouldn't be getting all those calls. If a company is selling something, it needs your written permission to call you with a robocall. And if you're on the National Do Not Call Registry, you shouldn't get live sales calls from companies that you haven't done business with before. Those calls are illegal. If someone is already breaking the law calling you, there's a good chance it's a scam. At the very least, it's a company you don't want to do business with. If you're not sure, hang up. If you're not sure about whether a call is legitimate or not, and are feeling pressured by the person on the other end of the line, just hang up. This is something that may be obvious, but I thought I'd include it because for those of us above a certain age, and probably a good number of people that are under a certain age, we were raised to be polite. If somebody called you, you answered the phone politely, and you listened to what they had to say. You didn't just hang up in the middle of the conversation. But if you're feeling pressured by somebody on the other end of the line who's trying to sell you something or giving you a hard time in some way, feel free to just hang up. You don't have to say anything, just put the phone down. I highly recommend that you check out the FTC phone scams page because I've had a personal experience with phone scams in the last week as a secondary character. Last week, my mother received a phone call and the caller ID came up on her TV and indicated that Wegmans was calling her. Ironically, she was on the line talking to me when the call came in. So we cut our conversation short and she listened to the phone message the caller left, asking her to call him back. She called the fake number and talked to the person masquerading as a Wegmans representative. He did indeed say he was from Wegmans and that he didn't know why someone was calling her. Then he asked her to verify her address and date of birth. And for good measure, he asked her for the name, address, and date of birth of a close contact too, saying that it was possible Wegmans might have been calling for that person. So she gave him my name, address, and date of birth as well. After she talked to the scammer, she called me back and told me what happened, and I told her it was a scam. I was 100% positive that Wegmans wouldn't call her and ask for her date of birth, never mind the name, address, and date of birth of a close relative. I did an online search for the phone number the scammer gave her and discovered other people had previously complained that that number was a scam number two. I subsequently called Wegmans to A, confirm that the call wasn't from them, it wasn't, and B, to let them know that scammers are targeting their customers. My mother called her bank and set up two-step verification for her account, which is always a good idea. And I subsequently changed my passwords for multiple online accounts and signed up with a credit monitoring service. Last weekend, 
I was called by the fraud monitoring department of my bank. And it turns out that despite my efforts to protect my accounts, that someone was trying to put through a fraudulent test charge of 97 cents. The charge was from an out-of-state company that I had never heard of. Thankfully, I was able to speak to a person in my bank's fraud department that same day, on the weekend, mind you, and we were able to cut the scammer off at the pass by deactivating my debit card. But my experience makes the point. Beware of phone scammers. Don't call anyone back via a number you don't know, even if the company is known to you and comes up on the caller ID. Instead, either use a phone book to obtain a number for the company and call them back via that number, go to the company's website online and find their phone number, or call your local library and ask the person at the records desk to look the number up for you. We are happy to do that. There are other ways too, unfortunately, that scammers will try and scam you, including sending you phishing emails with the same intent as the phone call my mother received, trying to obtain your personal information to either hack into one of your accounts or to create an account in your name and charge up a storm. So remember, knowledge is power and check out the FTC scam page. And finally, just a couple of tips to help keep your information safe in the internet universe. Change your online passwords at least once a year or use a password manager. Set up two-step verification for your online accounts as available. Check your credit report once a year. It is free and it can be done through one of the three major credit monitoring services, Experian, Equifax, or TransUnion. The credit report will show you the accounts listed in your name. So if there is one that isn't yours, you'll know. And finally, sign up with a credit monitoring service through your bank or one of the three previously mentioned credit agencies, and then you can be notified if a new account is opened in your name.
And that's the program for this week. I'll be back next week with another edition of Library Connections. Stay safe and be well.